Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still in the Boston metro area. I'm really excited to be talking about all things related to probabilities, Bayesian reasoning, applying that to things like the justice system, the medical system, engineering and project management and execution. We have the absolute privilege of sitting down with Dr. Murray Cantor. Hello. Hello. Hey, Alan. Thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks. Well, thanks for in, uh, inviting me to your show. You, it's a real privilege to talk to you. Thank you. And thanks to our friend Steve Wait for introducing us. Yes. Huge shout out. Yes. And it's so cool how you've been teaching me in just a short span of like an hour just why exactly probabilities are so serious in our world and why they matter so much. And you did a PhD in math at Berkeley and then you've been working over the last 20 years. You did work with IBM. The last 10 years you've been doing work with applying probabilities to actual execution flows and project mm -hmm. management flows. And now most recently the, uh, the CTO and the co-founder of Aptage, which is actually bringing this forth as an entrepreneurial system for people to actually be able to use yes. and apply and make their workflows much better. So also authored two books along the way. There's a lot of amazing work that you've done along the way and I'm excited to unpack that and, 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 and sh explain to other people why exactly this is so important. So let's start with your interest in mathematics because math is kind of like the code of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, where to start? <laughs> Why did you, how did you get picked up with it? Why did you fall in love with it? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I was always really, math for me was like my easiest topic, way back to junior high or something. Okay, so I always just assumed that that's what I would be a mathematician. And um, it, it, I, it's more than that it's easy, it's that it really gives you a kind of, it's both empowering and, and gives you insights to what's really going on around you. Yes. And, 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 and in a way that is just, so, uh, the words I, as I said, I use it as empowering, but I just love to know how things work. I sort of get behind magic tricks. Yeah. I get behind how systems really work together. And the language for all of that is mathematics. Yeah. Right? So it gives you the foundation for understanding the universe, really. Really well. Yeah. Yes. That's, and that's right. why I do it. And then I discovered over the years that there's lots of opportunity to apply these things to lots of really important real world problems. And so what I discovered sort of after I got my PhD is that I really didn't want to be an academic mathematician. <laughs> so I gotten that far just sort of a coasting, right? And then I realized I didn't, that, that, that was fun to know about, but I wasn't really turned on by the purity of mathematics. I was really turned on by how this really affected real world things. So I sort of retooled myself as an applied mathematician. And I've been just sort of applying that in a whole bunch of different domains ever since. So I have papers in physics journals, I have papers in geophysics journals, I have papers in engineering journals. Now I'm working on, uh, on applying AI methods for sports performance. Yeah. Uh, and it, the fact is, it's just wonderful to be able to play in all these different domains. And of course, aptage in helping people get better at project management. Yep. Yep. So this is so important because you're actually translating the mathematics into applied, again, applying the mathematics mm -hmm. into real world scenarios that are in many ways either like accelerate or augment performance. Yes. And they also do things like potentially eradicate errors that occur. Mm -hmm. And this is, these are both crucial. Right. And so, yeah, teach us about that. Well, I mean, the world is getting real complicated, perhaps you've noticed. Yeah. And there's a fear among some of us that the, we are building systems that are too complicated for us to manage. And I think, you know, and, and so if we're going to get our arms around that, we have to understand the likelihood of events, of, of, of what would happen if we do this 
what would have happened if we didn't do that. That's what uh, Judea Pearl in his Book of Why talks about intervention and counterfactuals. And we live in really wondrous times where we have the math to do this and we have the tools online and various uh, mathematics and power on the cloud that we actually can apply these mathematics to do things. So uh, as, I, as I tell my friends, it's a wondrous time to be a mathematician right now. We have, we have this real strong need to work with these complicated systems. Think about how hard it is to make medical decisions, like your friend in, who has, who's trying to make the right decision in a, uh, in, in, in a, an intensive care unit for uh, possible, most likely terminal patients. How do you make the right decision? Yeah. You need real frameworks to do this. We have those tools, people aren't using them. It's, and uh, the same kind of thing with building complex, the, prod, the kind of things we're building are highly integrated and highly complex. The teams that build them are highly integrated, highly complex. How do we know how they're gonna perform? Well, we don't, but we can, we can make, we can do the, we can start looking at the probabilities of how they might perform and what's the most likely outcomes. And again, we should be applying these tools because we have this problem and we have the, you know, need meets opportunity. It's so cool that you indicated that as we've evolved, we've moved towards complexity. Yes. And now humans find themselves as stewards of this rock and yes. earth. And now we have to figure out, okay, we're building these extremely complex systems. And yet humans are, we don't, we're not necessarily building the knowledge foundations to, to know how to manage these complex systems well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, it, it, it's so, but we have to. We of do. course, we have no choice. Yes. Right. So that's what's that's the underlying motivation of all this, really. I love it. I love it. And then we started hinting towards, and you you started hinting towards. Okay, there's 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 aspects to this in um, in athletics or in judicial or in medical or in project management and execution of engineering and design tasks mm -hmm. within companies. So. You know, so in your, in your in your career, as you as you slowly started getting to Aptage, tell us about that kind, that kind of twenty year chunk of time when you were like, okay, I'm applying this. These are the and these are the key areas that I want to see this applied as soon as possible. And then, how did you start doing yeah. that? Yeah. So my main journey is through project management. Okay, and for reasons that are, uh, you yeah. know. You know, there's, you don't want to get into too much history because then that'll take up the whole time. I'm old enough that the stories take forever. But, uh, <laughs> the Cliff Notes version. The Cliff Notes version. <laughs> but I, I was working on the graphics, I was working in IBM on the RISC System 6000, which uh, was IBM's answer to the Unix workstations based on uh, reduced instruction set technology. And so we were building a uh, new hardware architecture, a new version of Unix, AIX 3.0, and uh, a whole new graphics, I was on the graphics subsystem part, a whole new set of graphics adapters, whole new APIs, and we had to get this thing out the door in a certain amount of time. Okay. Ridiculous, you know, think about it, on the face of it, who would do this, right? And we did it, okay? And it came in a year late, but that's not in the whole history of that. And um, what I realized was that um, the ability of people to manage these kind of, we were being asked by our project man, by our stakeholders, when would we be done with this effort? Mm -hmm. I had literally four graphics adapters, three new APIs on an unstable operating system, and they were asking me, when were I going to be done? And the answer is, I don't know, right? So I made up a date and everybody was making updates and we were playing what I would call management chicken, which I was betting this guy was gonna turn himself in before I was gonna have to. <laughs> okay. Oh, we would have been on time if, if yeah, only yeah, they. Yeah. <laughs> right, or because he's late, he gets all the blame and no one notices that I'm late. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, and, and the, the day it really hit me, I was in my, I was in my manager's office and he puts up the Gantt chart and my task, and I'm supposed to have, I have on some nine month task and all this, building out the new device driver for this new thing. And he says, according to this, you're 48% done, aren't you? And I said, I had a choice. And I said, I could say no. And he then I'd get into a whole bunch of questions as why not, and I had no idea. So I said, yes, and everybody else said yes. 
and then the surprise came later, right? So, I, so I, what I became to realize is that I was being asked a ridiculous question that really mattered to the business. Yeah. Okay. That, and this sort of adversarial relationship that project managers get into with their management, where they, they, the management asks them a ridiculous question, and, the, and, and what happened with the Agile Manifesto, I think one way to look at it was that the developer said, we're not gonna do this anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to, yeah. to do this. And some people would take it to an extreme saying, you're going to get it when you get it. You can't run a business that way either. So this is when the math started kicking in. I started, so, and I started realizing that the time to complete a project like this, there's no such thing. Oh, and this is the other thing. If, if I gave them a, predic a prediction of when I was going to be done, I was measured on whether I was going to be, whether that number turned out to be right or wrong. Yeah. Right, so I started leading, a, uh, actually one of the things I did in IBM, I started leading a uh, interest group in project management. Mm -hmm. And I gave a talk at one of the, conf at one meeting, where uh, actually, actually Grady Booch, who was a great developer of object methods, was sick, and so they asked me to come in. So I played Grady at the conference. And I gave a talk called Embracing Uncertainty. And my main idea was that the time to complete isn't a known quantity, it's a probability distribution, or yeah. what we call a random variable. And the best thing, rather than get into a fight, it went, and so you don't, there's no one number which is right, there's just a probability of things that might happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so the right question is, do we understand the shape of this distribution, and should we manage it together, us, the management and the thing? And the room got real interesting. About a third of the room thought I was nuts, and a third of the room got sick. and a third of the room didn't understand me, and a third of the room said, "Oh my God! Thank God someone's been saying Vegas. this. Yeah. It's about time." Yeah. Okay. Which and and so I've been building out those techniques ever since then, which is essentially this: Let's you and I, management, agree that this is the likely set of outcomes. This is the, the time to complete is a random variable. Let's look at its distribution. And oh, by the way, let's manage that together because we can affect the odds. It's not true gambling. We can change the odds by working together. Yep. Okay. So that, and um, there's a good example of where you go and say, ask an engineer or mm -hmm. manager of engineers, hey, we have this project that we'd like to get mm -hmm. done. How long is it going to take to get done? Well, I have no idea. Yeah. Well, is it going to take three years? No. Is it going to take right. one year? No. Can you get it done in six months? Yeah, yeah, we could potentially yeah. get it. Yeah, six months would be the you know worst case scenario. Exactly. Well, what would be the best case scenario? Oh, well, maybe two months. Well, then that already brings it to a more of a period of certainty and then assigning probabilities to, it looks like probably four or five months would be a pretty safe bet. Yeah. What we actually do is, 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 is triangular distributions where, yes. we, where we look at, and what do you think is the most likely thing? And we build a distribution where it's no probability below the lowest, no probability above the highest, and the highest, then we sort of slope up to the max. And yeah. By the way, this is a technique that's been widely talked about by Douglas Hubbard in his book, How to Measure Anything. You know, so uh, the other thing that's interesting is all these ideas are out there. It's just a matter of putting them together. So, yeah. It really is. Into the systems of complexity to make them yeah. more certain. That's right. Yeah. And so each task has a, pro has, a, um, has, a pro has a triangular distribution associated with it. Yeah. Now tasks have dependencies and they go in parallel and all that. So computing the joint probability of the time to complete given all those things, well that's hard. There have been tools to do this for a while using Monte Carlo simulation. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're hard to, they've been hard to use, one of the things that, but this is getting us started. But the other thing that, that I realized was that the team completion rate or velocity is also not a number that we can know. It is a probability distribution, again, it's a random variable. Yeah. And particularly for things where are novel projects where it's not like building light bulbs where you can get to a steady state. You never get to a steady state, right? What does it mean to have a steady workflow for finding requirements. You know, if I, spend, if I spend five guys working at a certain rate to paint a wall, I, I can predict when the wall will get painted. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I have five guys working on requirements. How do I know how long that's going to take? Mm -hmm. Right? And adding a sixth person may slow it down, as Fred Brooks has pointed out. Interesting, yeah. Right? So I can apply those sorts of mathematics. To, it's applying the wrong math. Again, it's all about the math. Yeah. But there is a probability distribution that you can learn about rate, about rate to completion. So now I have to learn that probability distribution and I have to uh, include that with the various sizings and roll that up into, and now, now the math gets complicated because I have to use Bayesian parameter learning techniques and whatever. That's what led to Aptich, finally. Yeah. And so we do all that. And the whole trick now is to make that real consumable. And what we have found is that teams really adopt this nicely because we're just using, rather than throwing away information that they already have, because they know they have known unknowns. Mm -hmm. Let's capture the known unknowns and use that rather than throwing it away. Yeah. And you know, rather than arguing everybody into a single number, let's not even bother. Let's take the known unknowns, capture that as part of the project notes, and all that rolls up. And the point is that this is this is this is this is an example for project management that we're doing, but the same kind of reasoning that time, that the likelihood of an intervention working for a drug, or the likelihood that you really are drunk if you test positive on a test, all these things are random variables. Yes. All these things are probabilities. And as a society, we should get to a point we understand them and use them properly. Yes. Right. Yes. This where you're just where you're going there. I really <laughs> want to get to these examples for everyone. The, the, sure. Those examples are so so important because they're super applicable to our lives. And then also, um, I want to make sure as you were talking about things like uh, a, the triangular distribution, and you're talking about how in uh, uh, something like a rate of, of a velocity of a team being able to perform and you see that they, oh, they hit the four or five month mark, they're getting faster and faster and more effective at completing tasks. Mm -hmm. And then also the, you, were, you mentioned this to me earlier as well, the adversarial component is gone more so because you're, right. the, the, there's not as much of a, of a, of a tension going on between uh, between nodes in a hierarchy in a, in, a, in a company. Right. Yeah. There was also another thing which was the, I think this is so crucial, when, when, you, when you figure out that you have, you know, your, your engineering team potentially is given a task and the task is to get this done and you initially go for the lowest hanging fruit first, that that is going to bite you in the butt later because it looks like you're on, on map, on, on rate, or you're right. gonna get there, and then at the end you're doing the hardest things and you miss your deadline right. because you're doing the hardest things at the end. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So there's st classical project management, there's something called earned value. Okay, and the question is, how much of the work have you done with the dollars you've spent? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the idea is, is to uh, claim earned value for work that's completed, okay. So, and uh, there's still, this is still very strong and there's various teams that have what they call the earned value police, which, manner you, which, which, uh, which look at your projects. The trouble with that is, it, you know, people, people behave by trying to optimize the measures that they're measured by, okay? So that's why tax policy used to at least encourage home ownership by lowering ta uh, the thing, or if you, you tell, a better example, you tell policemen that they're gonna be measured by how many tickets they write, they're gonna write a bunch of tickets. Yeah. Whether or not they, they should right. have written a bunch of tickets, they're just gonna write a bunch of tickets. Yeah, right. and then if there's lobbyists involved in medical processes, and then there's going to be more of those medical processes, but how many of them were actually necessary? Yeah, yeah. Goes on and on. on, and on. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff about people being rewarded for prescribing drugs. Yes. For example. Okay. So, earned value was, so the project manager is saying, well, I'm going to get rewarded by doing the easy task because then I can claim earned value. Okay. Because there you go. What I noticed was, and others, that real progress in project management, I have this novel, risky project, a lot of uncertainty. 
I shouldn't be measuring progress on whether I've done the easy stuff. I should be measuring progress by whether I've reduced the uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Right, because the way it is, the day I started, I have a whole bunch of uncertainty. If I'm going to ship tomorrow, I better not have much uncertainty. Yes, and so you're be, what, what you're doing is you're asking people to tackle the hardest things at the start right. as best as they can. That way they maximize the certainty. Right, they, they, they remove the uncertainty over yes. time rather than just completing tasks. Yes, correct. Because that, that's how I know you're going to ship. Right? And that's not earned value. In fact, there are ways you could assign earned value to reducing uncertainty and everybody would win, you know, whatever. And so one of the other things we did in Aptage is actually show a graph while seeing how the uncertainty is being managed and whether it's going up and down. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because what we're trying to get everybody to collaborate on, and by the way, it's not just the manager with their management, it's also the managers with their staff. 360 kind of thing is that we should all collaborate on removing the uncertainties in our project so that we can make the goals that the project has. Now sometimes these goals are time-based and sometimes are other things. But we should know, again, if, if, if I've committed to ship tomorrow, I better know for sure that I'm going to be able to ship tomorrow. There should be no residual uncertainty in my project, mm -hmm. right? Now, if I'm four weeks out and there's a whole bunch of uncertainty, which can happen from your uh, scenario of the lowest hanging fruit, it's exactly what happens. They push the uncertainty to the end of the project where they have less time to deal with it. So there's an old saying in project management, which is 90% of the project is spent, 90% of the projects is spent with 90% of the earned value claimed. <laughs> okay. And this is why. What's cool about math, now we know why that is. Yeah. Because it didn't work on the uncertainty, they, would, they worked on, on claiming, the, they did the early, they did exactly what you shouldn't do, which is, is, is you increase the uncertainty by putting it off to the end of the project. Yeah. So not only are you increasing certainty for the teams of project managers and engineers and companies that really want, and now Aptage is being used by companies and they're mm -hmm. actually seeing great benefits by using right. the service. And I'm, I'm totally seeing lots more um, companies catching on to this. Oh, we can have more certainty in what we're building. We can have more certainty in our timelines, more certainty in our right. teams. So. Then there's also this sort of, it's, it's important to identify the, that the probabilities within, um, uh, within how, how to actually calculate and synthesize all of the probabilities. Because there's so many variables that go into this, it becomes difficult to actually figure out where the, the, where the, where the signal ends up being in, you know, you started giving these examples of when you're, when there's, uh, to, where people are getting ba paid based on the amount of tickets they give out or based on the amount of pharmaceuticals they give out. And right. so then that's creating these unjust systems right. in medicine and in justice. And so this becomes, this becomes a problem. And so we can potentially mend that problem. Yes. Yes, and there's an important point you make, which is there's two ways to deal with uncertainty. And one way is to have, don't do interesting things. Boring. No, but so, so one of the things that happens, if you insist, this happens though, if you insist that I have to make a date, oh. I'm not gonna take any risks, mm -hmm. right? And I'm gonna move out all the risky, interesting, which well, there, there's a risk reward thing here. Yeah. Which do, and, and, and part of what's going on in our system is the lifespan of, of companies is shorter than it used to be, mm. right? And so in order, because there's more disruption going on, so they have to take on novel projects. About, so it's not necessarily, so you don't necessarily want to reduce the initial uncertainty. You want to have methods for dealing with it. Yep. I've seen, compa I've seen, pro I've seen uh, companies who because of this thing, I, you know, of rewarding this is another false reward thing. If you reward project managers for hitting the date every time with the original content at the original budget, what you're going to see is more and more boring projects, less and less risk, less and less interesting stuff. 
So they actually move the, they actually manage the value out of their development organization. And in order to stay relevant, you have to take big risks, moonshot right. risks, innovative yes. risks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have to know how to manage those rather than avoid them. Yeah. And this is what I used to call embracing uncertainty. Right. Let's not let's not be afraid of it. Let's embrace it. Make it an opportunity. But you need the tools to do that. And that's where the problem. And if you treat uncertainty as the un, a risk and un, as, risk as the uncertainty in meeting a measure that matters to the business, then the way you assume risk is by understanding that uncertainty and working it off. Yes. And that's what the tools do. And we had this, we have this really good example where if you are building up the collective learning of civilization on top of, let's say, scientific mm -hmm. literature, and we're building it up and we're building it up, and something that's that was discovered just a couple years ago is Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to add something like his Higgs boson to our understanding of physics mm -hmm. uh, and put that into the knowledge foundation of civilization, you have to be extremely certain that that is correct. Right. And you have to have a very, very low probability of that we were wrong about that. Versus with medical literature, it seems as though you can, you were okay, no problem. One out of every 20 times, ah, it's no, no problem that that's wrong. That butterfly effects and cascades out and, and ends up causing a lot of harm because we are letting uncertainties creep into the foundation of what we're trying to build up as knowledge. All right, so the, we two issues here, two, two things to talk about here. One is sort of the standard, so uh, uh, a lot of us, call ourselves, identify as being Bayesians. That's a thing to be. And what Bayesians believe, this, Sean Carroll talks really nicely about this in his latest book, the, the, Big, the Big Picture, which is we believe in things for which we have evidence. Yes. Okay. And we don't think anything is 100% true. The, the, the stronger the evidence, the more we believe in it. And so the Higgs boson is the example is, and I actually looked this up. So, one, so they get more and more evidence that, the, that they had found the Higgs boson. They, they saw a signal, then they saw another signal, then they saw another signal. And they started looking, what is the joint probability of seeing all these signals? And at what point did they decide they, they were ready to declare? Yeah. And it turned out, that I don't remember the exact number, but it was something like one in 10 billion. Yeah. That they, so it's not 100%, but it's, re, it's a really good bet. Okay, now in the medical literature, as you point out, people will publish as the, uh, if the chance of them being wrong is, you know, they pee this significance of 0.05, that means that there's only a 5% chance that this happened by chance. By chance, yeah. But that means that one out of 20 articles just happened by chance. By chance yeah. And then the medical literature is, there's a whole lot of writing about this. And then the stuff that, then there's no one ever gets paid to find to actually do the experiment again. Again, and, that's and so a huge then we get into a lot of unreproducible effects, and and so it's really hard. Now the, the literature is getting better because people are getting smarter about this. Yeah, yeah, and and whatever. But it's and shout out to our friends Peter and Lindsay and and uh, Helen for doing the hoax papers because yes. that start, that's now starting to, uh, to, to, mm -hmm. to, to point out how we can't be letting the, the, the improper scientific evidence enter in the foundation that we're trying yes. to build up on. Yeah. Right, but the point of that, what all this is, that there's nothing 100% certain. So what, things, so what we need to do is be certain enough to make the right decisions most of the time, yeah. right? Or to make the right decisions in a way that is beneficial to a system, is economically makes sense, whatever. So I, I, one of the thing, exercises I'm working with the team, where we're looking at sustainability of uh, new, system, new systems and their impact on the sustainability of the oceans. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, so they're going to build a fish farm and they're going to do this. Okay, no, we can't be 100% sure this is going to be better than another model. But we can build a Bayesian net kind of model to find out what is the, what is the likelihood of this improving things. 
And then we can look at the investment and decide if that's the same kind of, uh, same kind of investment. And so there are investors in the world who care about this. They want to invest in things that both make money and improve the environment. Yes. But they need, again, this kind of Bayesian reasoning for that to, for that to work. We live in really wonderful times, though, that we have, uh, as I said, there's Judea Pearl's book on the Book of Why, but there's a whole lot of mathematics behind that. He has a book on causality, yeah. and then there's Fenton and Neil's book on Bayesian nets and their tools. And so we have the methods. It's just a matter of, but these are, as would Kahneman say, these are thinking slow kind of systems. Yes. But we need to be applying them. Yeah. The th That's really the point. And, and the more that I think that we think slow collectively, geopolitically as a planet, mm -hmm. the, the less oops moments we'll right. have. And we don't really have room for oops moments anymore. We just had Max Tegmark on this show from Future Life Institute. Mm -hmm. And you, when you had an oops moment with, with you know, the seatbelt or the airbag with mm -hmm. vehicles, that's fine. I mean, a couple, maybe hundred thousands of people died before that, okay. That's okay, but a nuclear weapon, a mutually assured destruction oops moment uh, yeah. a malevolent artificial general intelligence oops moment no we could <laughs> wipe out it's an existential crisis right. so when when we point out the the sort of um, um, there oh yeah this um, this like this the, the, the probabilities that 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 you can actually show as you as you go and 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 build them out inside of computer models mm -hmm. is so gorgeous because you're able to tweak the different variables like a a, um, a blood alcohol a measure measurement device a breathometer mm -hmm. right um, that you can't rely on it a hundred percent of the time right. and the same thing's true about something that's trying to find some sort of a, a, a medical ailment or something and so because of that you end up getting a certain amount of false positives mm -hmm. and then now you can actually model that as a probability you can also add another variable like age like sex like potentially uh, what type of car they're driving what their socioeconomic status is all different types of religion right. etc and then that those variables we can actually get closer to certainties in understanding these things and then we need to make better tools that are also less right. uh, uncertain right. so the, the point here is if you just give a person a without any other information and you give a person a DWI test and they test positive that doesn't mean they're, first of all, that doesn't mean they're driving under the influence. Because if you drive under the influence, you're, most li you're very likely to test positive with a test. But that doesn't mean if you test positive, you actually are driving under the influence. Now, those, not, and it, it turns out that it's remarkable how the, with like a 5% false positive uh, kind of number, which is sort of where these tests tend to be, and there's only one chance in a thousand or one chance in a hundred that a person is actually drunk anyhow. This would be going down a, a row of a hundred people and right. only maybe five of them are actually drunk and you would try and see out of the 95 people that aren't drunk, how many of them would get fa fla falsely flagged. Yeah, and yeah. it turns out that the percent of people who, who are, would test positive but aren't drunk is remarkably high, high yeah. like 20% in most of these things. Hmm. Okay, so now, but on the other hand, if they're driving a red sports car and they're 18 years old, mm -hmm. you can sort of show now the probability is two-thirds. It's higher, yeah. Now, in, in, in reality, now also if they're driving, you know, now, so if you're only relying on the tests, you're just stopping people at random and just relying on the tests, they actually threw the, there was a whole bunch of cases they actually threw out in the state of Texas because that's what they were doing. Now, if a person's driving erratically and you give them the test, now that's different. But that wasn't what was happening. So understanding the difference between if you test positive and the, the, if you're uh, drunk, then you're going to test positive. The probability of that is different than if you test positive, then you're drunk. Now that's true for, by the way, a lot of medical tests. Yeah. If you test positive for this disease, it, if you have the disease, you're very likely to test positive. If, you, if the disease is rare and you test positive, it's not all that likely you have the disease. And what the doctor is supposed to say is, I'd like to give you a different kind of test.
Okay, so there's another thought that I, occurred to me about uh, why Bayesian reasoning is really important. The way Bayesian things work is you start out with some prior belief and you adjust that belief with the evidence. Now, it turns out that you, for a lot of things, whatever your prior belief was, if there's enough evidence, it doesn't matter. You get to the right thing, and I can show you examples of that. If you have, if you 100% believe in something, no amount of evidence is gonna change you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is why it's so important to uh, leave uh, area in your ideology open have openness that right. way when you, someone is potentially adding to your perspective to help you see the world in a more truer way that you're receptive and right you can change, yeah. and I think Thomas Bayes 300 years ago actually wrote about this this is a very old insight yeah okay now let's look at some of the climate change discussion there are people who with no amount of evidence will let them believe will, they, they are so convinced 100 percent convinced that man isn't changing the climate, that no amount of evidence will change their minds. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, so part of what is important for us as a society is to understand that there's all, that to never be 100% sure of anything and always look at the evidence so that you can update your beliefs. Yes. This is so important. I love okay? that. Always be looking at Learning Link, more evidence, uh, adding more evidence to the equation to change your beliefs. To change your beliefs, that it's almost it's it's a steering process. It's a steering process. And if the ones that are willing to uh, to learn from more evidence as mm -hmm. they steer, they can steer into more truthful directions. Right. Yeah. And, and and the math will take you there. Math will take you there. So it's so it, to sort of roll this onto the beginning thing we talked about. Why, why mathematics? See so. This little theorem about Bayes' theorem, which says that, that what you do is you start out with some belief and then you update that belief based on evidence. And that if you are 100% certain in something, no amount of evidence will change that, is actually a way to understand some of the social behavior we're seeing. That's right. And some of the conversations. That's right. Right, and why you know you can you can expand that to gun control and whatever, to whatever, abortion, all those foreign things. Policy. Yeah, the, it's because we're that we we got trapped in a binary th thought process that right. I'm a hundred percent in my ideology. Right, and so no evidence can change, change that. that yeah. That's what the math will tell you. That's what the math <laughs> tells you. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. So we can actually bring a mathematics lens to our discourse yes. amongst one another. And so minimally what we can do is have um, a, 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 per, a, a percentage of, of, of openness yes. on ideologies. That way we leave an ability to stay open. Or like I like to do and I like to mm -hmm. urge people to do is to stay free thinking, stay independent. And that way, when you see people that are just watching Fox News or just watching CNN, that they have blind spots. Mm -hmm. That you gotta watch both, and you have to learn from other people that actually live, you know, in different parts of the world, right. and get firsthand information yourself. I like taking a math perspective on it. Binary thinking is 100% on your ideology, but the gray area, the nuance, is having 50/50 or 60/40, and oh, being even open. 80/10, 80/20, 90/10. It just needs some amount of willingness to learn from the evidence and see where it takes you yeah you know so I'm 90% sure of this but if you can show me some evidence I'm willing to change boom heard you know? it right here yeah that's, that's it yeah so this kind of thinking is just so so in project management we need to learn from the evidence of how the team is performing in uh, medical you know in the uh, medical things, we've got to apply Bayesian reasoning and to understand the probability of what various interventions would do properly, right? And then in looking at things around us as we learn together as a society, we have to learn from the evidence that we see. Yeah. Yeah, that's so the, To build the most just systems that enable the best flourishing. Right, yeah. and so us to, to to come to correct conclusions.
And make make good decisions. Murray, this is so fascinating that you're working on the applying the mathematics and applying these probability measurements into maximizing the efficacy of of these of different systems, yeah, that's, justice, that's the medical, point. Uh, engineering Project, projects. projects. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So, Murray, can, tell us about where you see all of this going because it's going to be applied into all of these different industries. We're going to basically put on a a math lens as we enter into probabilities, yeah. make it more certain. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, I don't know, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll just sort of, I'll just, something I'm just seeing now, okay? The answer could be, yeah, yeah. What do I, be, you know, I have, I have some belief in this, okay? Because uh, I, you know, I try to actually live and not, not only just talk about being a Bayesian. So some evidence I'm seeing, Yeah. okay? Judea Pearl's book, The Book of Why, is actually number one in its category on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm having all my friends read it and they all come back to me. And, and say, wow. wow. Yeah. Right. It asks really thought-provoking questions. Right, yeah. okay. The, the, uh, you see articles more and more, there was a recent article in the Wall Street Journal by Wadowski Berger uh, talking about the same kind of thing. So people are beginning to want, be, so it's beginning to permeate at least some level of the more general population. These techniques go back, you know, I don't know when they started, but you know, it really can be traced back with 300 years. But uh, Judea's Pearl work on Bayesian Net, and then Fenton and Neil's Agena Risk Tool, and there's the Bayesian Labs Agena Risk Tools. So we have, so I, what we're seeing now is it's, it's sort of coming out of the, um, it's moving down in, in sort of the intellectual planes to more and more thinking. And because we have the tools to do this, we have the, the uh, compute power of the web. It's like Aptish could not have existed if it weren't for the cloud. It just couldn't have, okay. Uh, the tools that I built it in are Python modules and things that make the programming efficient. Uh, so we, and people can build other tools. So the technology is here and people are beginning to think about the next gen of AI being more about, can I read an image better or play chess better or play Go better but can I start making better decisions Oof. about interventions? Yeah. Right? But that is going to be the next generation of AI. We're training it on narrow systems now to right. and also ma and now making it more general on yeah. better decision making for human oriented. It's, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's that I already see that beginning to happen. I love it. That so that's that's yeah, who knows where that's going to go, but it's already it's already beginning to happen. Because humans are so irrational at times and we-, we You think? You think? <laughs> <laughs> you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we are. We, we have a lot of emotion. We have a lot of uh, sleep deprivation. We have a mm -hmm. lot of uh, addiction. We have a lot of right. yeah, tendencies that we, we don't even believe that we actually do. But admitting that we do is the first step to this, right. <laughs> to solving it as a problem and letting things like a non-biased exactly. artificial intelligence help make these decisions when right. that's not sleep deprived, right. not so, emotional. So yeah. these systems will take over our jobs, but they'll, they'll really help us do these kind of jobs better yeah. and give us a, an objective, non-biased, you, you, you told me the stuff that you believe about these tasks and how we've looked at how these teams have performed or you tell, and the other examples I'm gonna, I've been looking at is uh, medical intervention. You've told us this data, or this is data that you've measured from population studies, right? And now you have to decide whether or not to administer this treatment or this surgical approach that might kill somebody, should you do it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, people are people are lousy at that. Yeah. Building a system that would know how to at least give you the best answer yes. would be real helpful. 
you know, it wouldn't replace the doctor. It would really help the doctor. Help the doctor. Right. You, there's, because Murray, how can we form this Bayesian network in our head, calculating dozens of variables? Oh, people are real lousy. So there's the classic example of the Monty Hall problem. Mm -hmm. Do you know the Monty Hall problem? I don't think so. Okay. So the Monty Hall problem is, is you know, based on, uh, let's make a deal, right? So the deal is, it's a standard problem. There are three doors. Okay. Oh, okay. You know the three doors problem? I think so. Yeah. Continue. Okay. So behind one door is a, is a car and between the other two doors is a goat. Okay. And the presumption is you'd rather have a door, you'd rather have a car than a goat. I know some people would rather have a goat than a car, but most people would rather have a car than a goat. Okay. And so you open up, you choose a door and Monty Hall opens up a different door and shows you behind that door there's a goat. And he says, do you want to stay with this door or do you want to, or do you want to switch doors? So now you have a 50-50 chance of a car. No, you don't. You don't. That's, that's right. See, that's always the, that's the thinking fast. Right. That is, that's the Dana Kahneman system, thinking that's right. fast. And Paul Erdos yeah. got this wrong, by the way. Paul Erdos got this wrong. Right, right. Wow. When, when this was first published, yeah. when this was first published by uh, what, Laura Von Savant or whatever her name was, she got the answer right in like one of these popular magazines. And a lot of people wrote in and said she got it wrong, including Paul Erdos. Paul Erdos. <laughs> okay, so, so there's so, two goats so, in a so, car. You so get shown one goat. And now, been, now, so yeah. you switch. Do you switch? And the answer is your chances are doubled if you switch of getting a car. Now, almost no one can get this right in their heads. Okay, it, it's, um, I think I started getting a little taste, a taste of it, that, that, the, that, that, the, um, that the door that you had selected was, um, was a door that potentially had the car behind it, mm -hmm. and then you were shown that one of the, that the, the, one of the door, doors that yeah, didn't have, did a, have car. a car. Yeah. Right, and the question is, should you switch to the other door? Yeah, correct. And you double your <laughs> chances by switching to the other door. And almost no one gets this right intuitively. Continue now. Right, okay, yeah. so the, the answer, I have my explanation of why that's true. Please. You can, by the way, you could, run, you could be a, a frequentist and run 100 experiments if you exactly. discover that. Yeah. Or you could just think it through. Continue. Okay, yes. so the way you think it through is, the chance of you being right was one in three. Yes, at the beginning. Okay. Right? Okay, so that means there's a two and three chance that it's one of the other two doors. Yeah. He showed you the, so did that change by the, him opening a door? Well, yeah. No, it's still two and three that it was one of the other two it doors. It was still two or three, but now it's changed. Now you know, and he did you a favor by showing which of the other two doors not to open. You see? Yeah, yeah. So the point is you got a new piece of information. He opened a door that didn't have a goat. You know more than you did before. So you had a one in chance three of being right. He opened the door. He still had a one in chance three of being right. And not only that, you actually know where the two and three door is. It's the one he didn't open. Oh, so that door has two and three chance now. Yeah. Why does the door that he didn't open, that I didn't select, have a two and three chance of being right? it had, Because he knew it had a goat. That's the point. He didn't open one by random. He opened one he knew had a goat. That's why this works. Okay? Uh-huh. You see? So the whole system, so this is a point that Pearl makes. There's a whole system here. Right, the system is you choose something, he chooses a door based on your choice. It wasn't an independent choice. The people think it's 50-50 is because it's an independent, he thinks that, they think that he was working independently, but he's not. Yeah. He made a choice based on what you chose. Oh, okay. Okay? Okay. But yeah. we don't, how do we know that he, Okay, because if I, that's the rules of the game. But that's the rules of the game. Okay okay, okay. okay. Now you could go into, well, is he going to follow the rules? You know, sure, but, sure. Yeah. Sure. But the point is that that even that amount of, and by the way, that solved easily. Bayesian reasoning gets you that real fast. I can build you a Bayesian that shows you this. That's cool. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, because yeah. it makes, gives us better decisions. It helps us with slowing down to think. Right. Yeah. Right. 
So you, and that's exactly it. We have these complicated systems that behave like the Monty Hall problem. Yeah. And we have to understand the probabilities of making decisions based on that. Yeah. So this is sort of like a toy problem, but it's not really. Because it shows several things. One is that almost no one gets fast thinking system works. I've had real arguments with philosophers. I had to take them through this very carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Then, <laughs> I have and, some questions. Yeah. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, okay. The, some questions on the way out. Um, first question yes. is, what would you say is a central guiding principle of your life? Um, as I said, I am. I tell people I'm a devout Bayesian. Devout Bayesian. I learn from evidence. Learn. I believe from in things for which I have evidence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah. No. Essentially, that's the guiding principle. That's beautiful. Okay. How about there are others, but that's of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about how about do you believe that we're in a simulation? Oh, all that stuff. What do you think? Oh no. You think this is a base reality? Yeah. There's there's real yeah. 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 Even though we're making simulations right now. Of yeah. Different no, 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 no. And I'll tell you why. You know, I actually have thought a little about this. Okay. Because the sim who have this simulation is so. So, for example, you lose your keys, five days later you find your keys, and then you remember that's where you left it. Uh -huh. The simulations are real good. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's remarkably consistent, right? The world we live in, it's, it's, it's so consistent, I don't believe it could be a simulation anymore. Okay. Okay. Really, no, it's, it's, it's a silly, it, you don't need it either. But it's also, re I'm also sort of amazed at how there's no, that things, are always entirely consistent. There's no glitches in the simulation, yeah, ever. Sure. Well, sometimes it feels like deja vu is a glitch. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. but that's something else we can talk we about. We can talk yeah. about. Um, how about, um, what is something that you believe to be true that almost no one else believes to be true? Oh, I don't know if there's anything like that. Um, no, I don't think there is anything like that. How about, what is the deepest emotion you've ever felt? Oh, God. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't even know if I can talk about that. I mean, I get, what's interesting, I think a better way to respond to this, I'm very rational about stuff. But I do respond very strongly emotionally to things. Yeah, you know what? Um, and I'm actually believe myself to be very empathetic. Yeah. So, like watching some of the things that are going on, with like at the border, I can get real angry. Yeah. For example, I don't know if that's the deepest emotion I've ever felt. Yeah. yeah. But um, why don't you want? Why couldn't you talk about it? Like, why did it come up that you didn't? Well, I don't even. I mean. There's not a deepest emotion. There's just not a well, deepest emotion. one of your deepest emotions, yeah. but yeah. Right. Well, uh, they're all very standard. I mean, you know, uh, deeply in love with my wife. Of uh, just these and the children, but right now I'm just so in love with my grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. That that's very deep. It is, yes. Yeah, I mean, and I love them to death, and, and of course, because they're still at that age. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, but, I, but really all of them. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, Deep love for family. Yeah, it's like that. Murray, how about, last question. Okay. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? You know, this is going to be, you can't not be syrupy, you know, or soupy about this, but the fact, the, see, the thing is, you know, I, I really believe that we're a small speck in the big universe and the, the, universe, the galaxy song and all that, right, Eric, I don't know all that stuff. But, you know, the fact that we, atta the, that we really 
develop emotional attachments for each other. That it's, 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 that we have empathy and we can really emotionally connect. I think is remarkable. It's really that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It it is this this sort of you know we evolved. I understand how that evolved and all that. But love and 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 and, and uh, of emotional connection is a remarkable thing. And it's it's yeah. still a great mystery. We'll learn more about it as we learn more about consciousness and stuff. Yeah. We're learning more about it now. It doesn't make it less beautiful. Yeah, this uh, as you say that it reminds me of when you look at someone's eyes. How crazy is it that you can aim to try and understand the last 20, 50, 70 years of their life yeah. that led them to the point where they're at. Today. Right, yeah. 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 That, you know, and the, the con, and you know, you can, with, without, with or without a religious thing, our consciousness doesn't, it's, it's things that blend. Yeah. Right, and that's what, that, that's a wonderful thing. Murray, this has been so enlightening. Well, thank you. I've learned so much, and I hope we all have <laughs> taken away the... Thank the, you so much. Thank you so much. The, For the opportunity. The yes. importance of probabilities, the importance of applying mathematics into our lives across all different domains, justice, medicine, projects. Mm -hmm. This is so important to do, and artificial intelligence is helping us with that. Mm -hmm. The link's in the bio for Aptage. Go check it out, aptage.com. Go and check them out. Um, also, give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and see what we can do with math and probabilities and applying that into our world. We'd love to see you create and you build. Go and manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Much love, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much, Alan. Thanks, Barry. Bye-bye. That's all she wrote. Okay, what fun.